Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Pat Dignan. Uh, I'm an engineer on the data infrastructure team at HubSpot. Uh, I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about uh, how we have a multi-tenant setup at uh, uh, HubSpot for HBase. And uh, after that, Graham is going to talk to you guys about G1GC. Um, so yeah. So when I'm talking about multi-tenancy, what I mean is that um, we, have like we have five clusters in production with um, each with hundreds of tables, and each of those tables has like you know a dozen or two dozen or three dozen clients, um, be, meaning applications accessing them, um, with crazy different workloads, like uh, different um, migrations going on every day, uh, batching batch workloads like uh, Hadoop uh, streaming things and APIs hitting them. Uh, so the reasons we do multi-tenancy is first of all that it is cheaper, it saves money. Um, and it also allows us to set up uh, logical divisions of our resources rather than, uh, rather than like, uh, just some sort of weird do it by wh what the use, uh, access pattern is. So you can kind of, like we have a, an email team which focuses on sending email. And like, they have a variety of access patterns for their cluster. And so uh, they, can, they can have all that on one logical place. It also gives us the ability to run fewer clusters. So rather than like divide it up by workload, you get that like a small number. So we have five instead of like 40 or 50. So we're kind of trading the complexity of running that, cluster, that smaller number of clusters that are more difficult to manage for rather than running a lot of clusters, which has its own complexities associated it. And we still get that benefit of having lower costs. Um, when you do have a multi-tenant setup like that, it's important to uh, know who's misbehaving. So one of the most important things for us is finding those bad actors. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't really have a lot of luck with the tooling built into HBase. Uh, so we wrote our own thing called HBase Tracing, unfortunately closely named to HTrace. Uh, it's totally different. It's a client-side tool that basically uh, sends us all of every single request that, like metadata about every single request that comes into our HBase clusters. Um, and so we kind of have two, role, two ways of viewing that data. Uh, one is an ad hoc qu like querying. It's like it goes into a Redshift database, and we, and we do SQL queries on it to kind of figure out what might be going wrong. Or we have like a roll-up view, which is kind of like a high-level view, like, OK, what, what's going on in these tables? Um, so we have like. 300 to 400,000 requests per second going into that last time I checked, which was a couple months ago. Um, so to talk a little bit more about that uh, ad hoc querying, so the, the Redshift database gives us the ability to just kind of slice and dice all, by all these different uh, parameters. So we can you know, re request uh, size and response size, time, and then like source and de uh, destination information, like the cluster, the table, region, and then the source application which uh, makes it pretty easy to find things. And then as we used that querying, ad hoc querying over time, we found that um, we were doing a certain set of queries over and over again. Uh, so those are some of the ones that we did. We, uh, we basically set things out by like the outliers. So if there is like a region getting tons of huge requests, then we have like an event feed of like those huge requests over some certain threshold. Um, we also track things with, but that have like large, large requests or um, response time. We do those actually all the time for every application, every table. So if we can see like any given table is suddenly spiking up, we have like good easy visibility into that. Um, so actually, one example is this uh, incident here. So you can kind of see that green line's going nuts. So we noticed um, one of our app, uh, one of our clusters was having a bad time, and uh, so we we looked over at our, our roll-up data. And we saw that one of our um, one of our tables was getting like hammered with uh, requests. So this looks like it's uh, getting about 200 megabytes per second, which is pretty abnormal for the cluster that was on. Uh, as you can tell by like the rest of the tables, kind of getting a pretty small amount. Uh, and once so once we found that, we we just had to go into our like uh, Redshift database and kind of like okay, what are the clients accessing this table? Um, so then once you found those people, the, those applications, you have to like cope with that somehow. Uh, in the case before, we could just like, you know, talk, talk to the team. It was happened to be during work hours. We could talk to the team and say, oh, OK, can you guys like not do that? That would be great. And then uh, you know, when, say, it's not on, on uh, during working hours, we can use uh, HBase quotas, which were introduced in 1.1. Uh, uh, they kind of allow you to limit things that are doing too many requests or too big of requests. And um, 
you know, by different, different criteria like user, table namespace, uh, global limits. And then you can set up separate throttles for uh, reads, writes, and like a joint throttle for both. So maybe you might have like, OK, this user can only do 100 requests per second, or um, this table can get a combined you know, input output of like 200 megabytes per second. Uh, so there are a couple things to know about uh, deploying quotas. Uh, first of all, the, the re limits are all by region server. Uh, someone talked about that earlier. Um, which kind of can, it can be a little troublesome if you have like a table that isn't well balanced across your cluster. Uh, so like if it had one table, one region has, server has four regions for a given table and then another has two, if you're setting limits at the uh, table level, then you're kind of, you might run into some issues there. Um, the other thing is that the, knowing how the Hadoop username is set is basically in a secured environment, it's set with the uh, Kerberos as, and, um, in a non-secured environment, it's set with the Hadoop username environment variable. And so we took advantage of our uh, past singularity to set that at, for all of our applications. So it's set by like the deployable name. Makes it really easy so we can, every single different application has a different username in uh, Hadoop for us. Uh, so quotas are really well uh, designed to help with like pretty straightforward situations. Someone's requesting too much data. They're sending too many requests. Um, and also, you can like prioritize your workload. So maybe you want to like focus on having your API be super responsive and not your, you know, and have your batch or streaming workloads, you know, have a lower bandwidth limit so they don't destroy the cluster for the APIs. Um, so a good example would be this case right here. Like we did handle it person to person this time, but say this had been off hours, we would have just kind of, you know, set a quota for them. Um, unfortunately, quotas don't solve all of the problems we ran into. Um, so sometimes we have like threading issues, and like if say all the RPC handlers for certain like a scan for scans are used or but, or, read, or reads or writes, then we uh, quotas don't really give us any help in that situation. Um, and they also, you know, if some uh, operations are a little bit more expensive than others, so like uh, check and put and increment can especially uh, can be uh, problematic, and also like inefficient scans, it doesn't take a huge number to really screw things up. Um, so it can be a small number of requests and not even requesting a lot of data, but they can be chewing up like RPC handlers, like I mentioned before. Uh, to deal with that, we uh, introduced uh, these things called detention queues. So they're basically, um, basically a separate set of RPC handlers and a separate queue for uh, things that are like, kind of determined to be bad actors. And so they're a small proportion of the overall pool, which allows us to prevent the, uh, the starvation of, other, of those RPC handlers by other actors. Um, so it's kind of handy to have. Uh, so ideally, we'd love it, it to uh, automate the putting things in like detention and throttling. So we're, we're kind of working on trying to figure out a way to do that automatically, like what criterion makes sense to do that, but it's not there yet. Uh, when you are running with these, like, with these highly multi-tenant clusters, uh, it's much more important to manage risk because like, if the cluster goes down, so many more things are impacted, or even just you know, something slow, you have so many more things impacted. Uh, so one of the things we can use to do that is uh, read replicas. They were introduced in HBase 1.2. And basically, they allow you to have like a primary and then a secondary uh, replica to read from. And so like if it, after a certain timeout, it can, your rec get request can fail over to a secondary uh, region server rather than the read from the primary. Of course, when you do that, you, re you might be getting stale reads. So that's worth noting. Uh, so to set that up, uh, there's a couple, a couple things you need to do. The first thing is to enable, re replica, uh, uh, enable replication. And then on your, your get requests or whatever, you can set uh, consistency to timeline rather than, uh, rather than strong. And then when you get your result back, you, on the result, it has the uh, is stale method, which will tell you whether you got any stale results. The other thing worth knowing about that is um, the uh, in your table schema, you actually have to specify how many uh, replicas you want. So if you want to actually enable replicas, it's, well, it's for the column family. But you, can, you need to specify that in the scheme, at that schema. So that's uh, worth knowing. Uh, so these are the timeouts that I was talking about before. Um, so you, want, you have separate timeouts for gets and multi-gets. Um, multi-gets probably take longer uh, it's in, than your gets because there are more of them. Um, but uh, we found that they didn't really solve all the problems that we were having. 
Uh, the, the, one of the big things is they do, I, I mean, they do increase the uh, memstore usage. Um, so if, however many replicas you have, that'll be, that'll be like the multiple of your increase. And also, like, you know, it's all within one data center. So, uh, you know, if that data center goes kaput, you're not really getting any resiliency there. And if you have, put, like, somehow push out a bad configuration, you're not really getting protection there. And there's no real easy rollback without a rolling restart or something like that. Um, so, because of that, we started using uh, cluster replication. You know, that's inner cluster replication. Um, so it gives us that data center level protection, allows us to do those like uh, you know failover style reads um, or, or config uh, deployments. Uh, so you know you can make your change on your secondary cluster, do the restart on that, and then make sure you know flip your traffic over to that, make sure everything goes well, then do the same on your what was your primary. Um, it also allows you to like maybe you have some analytics type workloads that um, you want to just run that don't need the most up to date data or whatever they can work off of that cluster rather than the primary so it takes some load off it also st sets you down the path of uh, geographic distribution um, uh, we didn't really find it super easy to use so we wrote a wrapper at, um, to access that so to handle the failover. Um, so we wrapped uh, like the table scanner and um, uh, buffer mutator interfaces so that they'll, they kind of can handle these situations intelligently. Um, so we ha we ha what we do is we have like a configuration in Zookeeper that just says, okay, this, these are the two clusters, like it's a super cluster. So like as far as our clients are concerned, it's actually just one cluster. But it says, okay, this is the, like say you have a cluster A and then or cluster one, and then like you might have in Zookeeper, what it, it's actually two separate H-based clusters, like cluster one A, cluster one B. Uh, so we store that in Zookeeper as long as, as well as like whether it's read-only or not. Uh, so that allows us to, and then so like the clients will watch that and look for any sort of failover. And um, when as soon as that changes, the the because uh, there's a Zookeeper watcher, as soon as that changes, that that information is propagated up to the clients. They stop trying to send write requests, and um, they'll fail over. Uh, it also allows you to do those configuration uh, role, uh, failovers, so um, you can just kind of more easily do that uh, just by changing what's in Zookeeper. Uh, to make this all easy for our app developers, we basically uh, we introduced this uh, stale read-only annotation, which um, so basically it's a method scoped annotation that kind of does, uh, I don't know if anyone's familiar with the, the Guava bind intercept. Um, you can just say, uh, it basically allows you to wrap um, a method so if you, so it basically you say, okay, uh, your stale data is okay in here. No permutations are allowed, uh, or no mutations are allowed, and um, it'll appropriately fail over for gets and scans. Uh, so like for example, if a scan will fit, will fail over only if it hasn't called next yet, um, and uh, a get will fail over as long as you allow it. It also allows you to uh, specify a primary and a, a secondary. So if you want to if you want to go to the whatever, whatever the actual primary cluster is, then you can use, specify that in the annotation. Or if you can accept that stale data and you know that and you want to go off the secondary, you can do that there. Uh, the last thing I wanted to talk about was uh, monitoring. It's just some things that we've like uh, noticed are pretty important to keep an eye on. Uh, so the, the main thing is uh, the request queue time. Uh, we want it to be like under a millisecond. Basically, we want it to be zero milliseconds almost all the time. Uh, most of our clusters kind of keep to that. It basically, if that goes up, it quickly propagates to the rest of our applications. Um, so that can be pretty problematic um, because in a, in a distributed uh, system, these things kind of all add up and we have a microservice architecture. So if even 1% we found represents well what the pain that our clients are feeling is. Um, the other thing is the request process time. Usually that's pretty stable for our clusters. Um, we Sometimes with things like compactions going on, it might go up. Um, but if that's going up, it's definitely a thing that we want to look for. Um, and one other thing, uh, we, I was talking about a little bit earlier about how important the handler thread utilization is. We actually have a, a patch um, that we wrote to um, monitor that at a user level. So now you can see, OK, which, which users are using the uh, handler threads, so you can get an idea of what might be chewing things up. And then the other thing that really isn't covered by all of these is the region stuck in transition. We haven't fully finished like researching this, but basically sometimes we've noticed that some regions get stuck in transition, and we haven't 100% figured out why. 
So that's just something we alert on when, when that happens. Uh, some of the other things that we, some other like uh, issues we've seen that more uh, causes of problems rather than symptoms are uh, like the GC pauses, which uh, Graham is gonna talk about in a minute. Uh, scans with long next calls, so basically inefficient scans. Compactions, like if there's a huge number of compactions going on, then you might see some issues. Um, uh, not, like a large number or huge requests coming in will uh, cause GC, so that can also cause issues. Um, so that tends to be like a bad actor type, type thing. Uh, the other thing we've occasionally run into, not super often, but uh, sometimes we'll like saturate the NIC on our region servers, and like, you know, it's important to keep an eye on that, even if it is pretty rare. It's still, you don't want to spend hours digging into it if that's, not, if that's the problem. Uh, so, yeah, inefficient scans, we, um, this is kind of a problem point for us. They can be pretty hard for us to find. Uh, we, the, basically, the uh, proxy we use to see, see what's going on there is um, the handler thread utilization. So we, we look, okay, like if this is high, then we just kind of, um, we start looking deeper and we look in our uh, HPS tracing data that, we were talk that I was talking about before. And, we, and then once we've like, figured out what's going on, we like, might take a thread dump on the server to just see, okay, like, all these threads are spending time on th in this filter or something like that. Uh, kind of give our teams, to kind of give our teams like some advice about what's going on and what might be the problem. Uh, and the other thing, the last thing is like large requests. Um, like I was saying before, we basically rely on our roll-up view uh, to find these for us, and then once we found them, we just push them out to the team or use throttling to, uh, to limit them. Uh, I think that's it for me, so uh, I'll turn it over to Graham. All right, hi, I'm Graham. I'm an engineer at HubSpot uh, with Pat on the data infrastructure team. Uh, so G1GC, this is the G1GC tuning section of our presentation now. Uh, what I'm gonna do, uh, I'm gonna explain why we use G1GC for HBase, uh, but also why we need to uh, tune it, why we needed to tune it to avoid poor performance and instability on our region servers. Uh, and then I'll run through uh, quick hits of some changes you can make and some tuning you can do in your cluster to see uh, good performance with G1GC uh, off the bat. Uh, walk through a couple other considerations and optimizations um, that might be uh, relevant to your use case at the end. And uh, hopefully that'll do a, a good job getting you started with G1GC. So like I said, why G1GC? Uh, Basically, we use G1GC at HubSpot for anything that uh, needs to be a low latency response time. So not only HBase, a couple other data stores, and all of our APIs use G1GC. Um, so the reason we use it for low latency is because even though G1GC does do more stop the world pauses, uh, where the JVM is temporarily stopped, um, it does more of those than uh, other garbage collectors, but those pauses are consistently very short as long as you've tuned it right. Uh, so that, that's the challenge, but uh, we find it's worth it to tune it. Um, the reason, uh, oh, the other thing, so the reason it, it scales this way is because it divides the heap into uh, s much smaller G1 regions of memory, uh, ideally 2,048 or so regions, um, and then it can operate on subsets of these uh, as it goes rather than going through the whole heap. Um, so even when you're cleaning out your old, uh, old generation, um, or as it's called in G1GC, your tenured space, uh, it can go in, in many smaller, faster pauses uh, instead of one big one. Um, I mentioned tenured is the old generation, so the lingo for young generation in G1GC is Eden. So I'll be referring to Eden and tenured, and that's what I'm talking about. Um, and because it treats uh, the heap this way, broken down into smaller regions, it's also a choice uh, a great choice for large heaps because um, it, scales, it scales very well uh, due to, to breaking it down that way. So another good reason to use it for HBase. However, uh, if you just throw G1GC onto your region server at JVM, you will, you will probably see problems. Uh, we had, did our initial tuning based on, uh, we got some help, there was a, a good Intel blog post a couple years ago, um, got us started. Definitely helped, um, but we were still seeing some things, uh, some basically some unacceptable performance. Uh, three main things. So 
The first one, uh, we were just spending too much of our overall wall time in GC. Uh, at peak times, our busiest clusters uh, were spending 20 to 25 percent of their time just in GC pause. Uh, I don't need to explain it. That's very bad. Um, and in addition to that, occasionally region servers would have a very long GC pause, which was counter to the purpose of running G1 uh, in our mind. Um, so even though they weren't frequent, they were regular enough that uh, we knew we needed to eliminate them. And, and when I say very long, I'm talking about um, basically any, anything over one second, but especially over five seconds, over 10 seconds, any time the JVM is paused for that long uh, is not acceptable for our HBase clusters. Uh, the last thing we saw is kind of G1GC's uh, out of memory exception. Um, this happens when the heap is full, and not necessarily full of live data, but full of allocated instances. Um, some of them are probably dead, but in order to clean them out, uh, once the heap is completely full, G1GC does a full GC, very similar to a full GC in another garbage collector, uh, where it just it pauses the JVM probably 20 plus seconds for a large heap, um, and by then your region server has died a slow and painful death, and your cluster is uh, having a bad time. So uh, we set out months ago to, to fix all these issues, um, kind of a preview of what we accomplished uh, by the end. So currently, not to say there's no more tuning to be done, but currently those busy clusters at peak times um, instead of 20 to 25 percent, they'll spend 5 to 8 percent of their time doing GC. Uh, there's no more very long GC pauses. Um, we'll very occasionally see a pause of like one or one and a half seconds, but uh, for the most part, those have been eliminated, um, and we see no more two-space exhaustion uh, occurring, uh, except, as Pat was mentioning, sometimes there are very bad actors. Um, there's a certain amount of bad acting you can't really tune around, but as far as tuning goes, those have, uh, those have been eliminated. So before I get into the solution, this is a, a good example, kind of a basic example of uh, what we were seeing a lot when we started tuning. This is a graph from a tool uh, written by our own uh, Eric Abbott, who's a, another G1GC kind of specialist we have. It looks at a GC log and parses it into a graph. This particular graph is showing uh, heap usage. So that top blue line is the total Eden plus tenured space. The green line below it is a uh, tenured space, so the amount of data in tenured could be a combination of live and dead data. Uh, the red line above the purple dots there, that's our Eden size, so it stays pretty constant. Uh, we keep it low, we'll get into that later. Um, but then the, the problem, and you can see this black line, that's our initiating heap occupancy percentage. Um, this is basically a threshold. Anytime tenured space goes above that line, we're we're triggering a concurrent marking sweep. We're going to start uh, doing a, a mixed GC as soon as we can. So a mixed GC, like a, a major GC in another garbage collector, is a GC where not only do we clean up Eden's objects, but we clean up the tenured space. Um, a much more expensive undertaking. It's slower, uh, as you can imagine. It looks at more regions. We try to avoid them as much as possible, except before we started tuning, we were actually doing them constantly because Tenured was always above the, uh, the IHOP, as we call it, initiating heap occupancy percentage. So it would finish a mixed GC, it would still be above that line, it would kick off another sweep, and we'd just do another one. Um, this was a big part of why we were seeing high percentage of time in GC, and it was also um, a cause, mixed GCs are almost always the ones that are very long, um, because they're the more expensive ones, and outlier can be the one that's five to 10 seconds. So we were seeing more of those for the same reason. Um, and we were also, this is kind of an enabler to the to two-space exhaustion I was talking about, where when you're operating like this, it doesn't take much for a bad actor um, or just, you know, too much workload to fill up your heap and cause the full GC. So let's get into some things, some basic things you can do to get running with G1GC and avoid all those problems. Uh, these are recommended defaults. Uh, we I would pretty much recommend them across the board. Um, I'll go through four, the four of them real quick. So um, max GC pause milliseconds or millis is not uh, an accurately named parameter. Our, our max GC pauses are definitely more than 50 milliseconds uh, on our large heaps. Um, what that parameter is doing is 
it's really, it's more like a target. Uh, if you have a pause that's less than that time, less than that, uh, so if you had a 40 millisecond pause, G1 will think, oh, I have a little more room to play, and it will increase the size of your Eden space, your young generation, trying to basically get every pause to hit 50 milliseconds. Um, 50 is, a, is an unreasonably low number uh, for a heavy load on a huge heap. We set it this way intentionally because we basically we want to pin Eden at, at its minimum value so we have a predictable Eden size. Um, so that, I just wanted to explain why, why we set that so low. Max, 10 year threshold. Uh, this refers to how many times an object has to survive in Eden, uh, young gen, before it gets promoted to tenured. Um, we set this to one, meaning if, if uh, an object is still alive in Eden after two GC events, we'll just throw it uh, immediately into tenured. We do this because HBase, uh, most of what survives that long, the vast majority of what survives that long in a region server's heap, um, Eden space is block cache uh, or memstore. And those things we figure, yeah, they're going to be around for a while. <clears throat> why, why keep copying them back and forth in Eden? Let's just put it in tenured, um, save some time during young GCs. Uh, heap waste percent, uh, we set this to 10 from the default of 5. Uh, this is how much heap you are not cleaning up during a mixed GC cycle. Uh, we do it this way because uh, to increase mixed GC efficiency um, and reduce the time uh, a mixed GC will take, uh, because a mixed GC cycle will start by collecting your most dead regions. Really easy, just copy a few objects out and call it done. Um, where you get into trouble with mixed GCs is when you're cleaning up kind of the bottom of the barrel. Uh, regions that have some dead data in tenured, but a lot of live data, and you have to copy all the live data out. Uh, so when you're scraping the bottom of the barrel, mixed GCs tend to take a long time. Um, increasing this to 10%, that extra 5%, really reduced its effect sharply um, and gave us much better mixed GC times at the end of a mixed GC cycle. And the last one, uh, the mixed GC count target. So once you're above that, the IHOP from that previous graph, you'll uh, you'll start the mixed GC cycle, and each GC event after that will do one over this value uh, portion of the, <clears throat> of the tenured regions that need to be cleaned. So if we had 32 regions that need to be cleaned in a tenured space, by setting this to 16 instead of the default of eight, we'll spread those out over twice as many mixed GC events. This keeps the events shorter, and it also makes the, the pause times less volatile um, which is definitely a good thing. Okay, so that's the easy stuff. Um, clicker is not working. Can we go to the next slide? Yeah. Okay, so now tuning for your specific cluster and use case. Uh, these are the important metrics that you uh, should keep track of. So if you don't already, uh, it's really good to throw these in whatever you use for monitoring so you can look at them over time. Um, from that top row, so the Eden and tenured size can be calculated from your GC logs. Uh, there will be a line like that at the bottom after each GC event. So Eden uh, will tell you, it'll be zero, the size of Eden will be zero but it, after GC, but it'll tell you how much space is allocated for Eden. Uh, survivors is a subset of kind of the young GC space of surviving uh, objects that aren't in tenured. So you can subtract survivors from heap and that will give you your tenured size. So Eden and tenured size, very relevant. You want to know those. Um, and then the other three are from the region server JMX stats. So if you can collect JMX stats, you can easily collect those. Uh, mem store size, block cache, and the static index, which is like an overhead of the region server. These are the th three main uses of memory in a region server. Um, so we, we want to know what those are. Uh, because next, oh, wait, did it work? Yeah, it worked. Great. Uh, so these are the things, uh, these are the parameters we're going to use to tell the G1GC algorithm uh, what to expect. And once G1GC knows what to expect, it can perform well. Um, so the first two, that's your heap size. We're going to keep it constant, uh, minimum and max the same. Uh, we're going to set our Eden size, which is what G1 new size percent is. Uh, if Eden is set, um, so that, that's the minimum size. I talked earlier about how we're pinning it to that minimum value. That's what that is. And the initiating heap occupancy percent, uh, that's the IHOP, that's that threshold when we start mixed GCs. So those are the three main JVM args. 
uh, other than the ones I just talked about, that are going to dictate how G1GC behaves. We're also going to modify, we're going to set the uh, block cache size and memstore size in HBase, uh, kind of cap those at an upper bound um, so we know what to expect. Um, so here's how we do it. We're going to determine basically the, the worst expected use case for a region server where it's doing just the most work uh, basically possible for the, uh, the clients of this cluster. So look through those metrics that you've all been taking for weeks from the JMX and uh, determine the maximum block hash size, point in time, mem store size at a point in time, could be different points in time, and a static index size from any region server across that time period. Um, and when you have together those things, if you imagine them all being that big on the same region server at the same time, and then you multiply that by 110%, or you multiply each one by 110%, that's basically, this is the absolute maximum we expect on this cluster. If you know that there's going to be more usage or traffic in the near future, 10% might not be enough to add, but you get the idea. So we're going to set the IHOP, uh, that initiating heap occupancy percentage, and the heap size such that uh, heap occupancy, um, so the IHOP will be greater than all those maxes, that like worst case memory usage scenario, by at least 10% of the heap. So that even when this region server is running completely at capacity, um, there will be 10% of a buffer between the tenured space and the, uh, the IHOP threshold for dead data to build up before we have to do a mixed GC. Um, and we'll show you what that looks like in a sec. The other thing you have to keep in mind is that your IHOP and your, Eden, your minimum Eden size together uh, have to be less than 90%. There's a 10% reserve. Um, basically, you need space in your heap for when a uh, tenured goes above IHOP but hasn't been cleaned yet, or uh, if a humongous object comes in, which is what it sounds like, uh, it'll be allocated out of that space and put directly into tenured. So you need some extra heap as a buffer. If you have calculated your IHOP, and you're like, dang, this plus my heap, my uh, Eden size is, is too much of my heap, you're going to have to increase your heap size and recalculate. OK, and then the other thing we do, this is kind of a safety precaution. Uh, in our HBase site, we, just, we take those 110% max usage numbers we calculated, and we use them to set the block cache and memstore caps in HBase. This is just kind of a guarantee, so we know that G1GC will get what it's expecting uh, based, based on what I just talked about. OK, so we sh I showed you this before. We made the changes I just talked about, uh, nothing else. And, let's, and, and you can see, hopefully, you can understand the visual of, of how it looks after. So your, your, ten, your uh, tenured usage, still that green line, uh, it's pretty close in color to the total. But the lower one is tenured space. When we do a mixed GC, you can see it drop all the way down. Uh, those yellow dots show how much we cleaned up at each, uh, each event in that cycle. Um, and, it, and there's much more time compared to that previous graph, which was just a jitter of constant tiny GCs, which were probably scraping the bottle of the barrel and being extra slow anyway. Now we have a nice clean rhythm. Uh, we're going down and then slowly climbing going down. Um, and you can imagine. How, how little time we're actually spending doing mixed GCs compared to just young GCs while it builds up. Um, there's a few other things uh, you can think about. I talked about the reserve percent. Uh, this is, if you, if you know your clients like to just show up with a, a truckload of requests every once in a while, um, you should make sure your IHOP and your Eden are Le, uh, much less than 90, maybe less than 80, maybe less than 70, depending on your use case. Um, you can set this with the, you can kind of set this with a reserve percent. You don't need to. You need to make sure mostly just at the IHOP plus the new size percent, that Eden, that Eden configuration is, uh, is low enough to accommodate some extra space when you get a burst of requests and don't have time to clean them uh, immediately. Um, heap region size. So, the higher the better, but not so strictly. You, you want to aim for a target of 2,048 G1 regions uh, in your heap. If there's no clear choice, like if you have a 40 gigabyte heap, we have clusters with 40, 45 gigabyte heaps, uh, we find it's better to err on the side of fewer, larger regions. So we like to use 32 megabyte regions, which is the max, uh, 
Uh, these are G1 regions, not region server regions. Um, 32 is the max. It has to be a power of 2 megabytes, 1 through 32. Uh, it's a little confusing. Um, and this will help also. Uh, we find it reduces occasional long pauses that can happen when you scan a lot of regions if they're smaller. Last thing, uh, you can tune your Eden size. If you really want short individual pauses, you can lower that, uh, but you'll see a slightly higher percentage of time spent in GC, and the uh, opposite is true. If you increase your Eden size, your total percentage of time spent in GC will uh, go down, but your individual young GCs will go up. Um, and if, yeah, as mentioned here, unexpected, excessively bursty traffic or uh, too many humongous objects, which is like requests asking for way too much data, uh, you could theoretically just like give yourself huge buffers. Generally, the much better uh, fix is the client code should be changed, um, just to set some expectations about what magic you can do. OK, and the last thing I want to get to real quick, uh, block cache, caching is not free. I don't know if you can tell that that's two lines, but it is. Uh, one of them is percentage of time spent in mixed GC, and the other one is block cache evictions. What this basically means is if you're doing gets and scans, and you don't think, like maybe it's a Hadoop job or a, a Kafka consumer, and you don't think you'll be hitting that same uh, data immediately uh, in the future, you should disable scanning, uh, disable caching uh, on that request. Um, because this data just gets thrown into cache, causes a sooner GC, goes into tenured because it's surviving, and then it just it's more mixed GC time that has to be spent cleaning it up. So it's it's a double whammy. Um, you can do that with set cache uh, set cache blocks false, I believe, on a get or a scan instance. Okay, and that will help. That's something your clients can do, but it will help your server uh, GC uh, dramatically. So tune heap, the basic uh, method I went through. There's a couple other adjustments you can make depending on your use case. And sometimes it's just your clients here have more to do with your server GC than we'd like to admit. Uh, here's a blog post. Uh, it's all this that I talked about and more in depth. And it kind of covers the whole story of us investigating and tuning GC. It also has a link in it to a G1 GC foundational blog post written by uh, Eric on our team. Um, which is just more of a, a knowledge base about G1, not specific to HBase. Um, we have a couple open source plugins. Um, the log visualizer generated most of the graphs, and we have a CollectD plugin that will watch your GC logs and put them into CollectD, uh, put stats from them into CollectD uh, if that helps you.